Section 14 of From the Latchkey of My Bookhouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. From the Latchkey of My Bookhouse, edited by Olive Bupre Miller. Kate Greenaway, English, 1846 through 1901. Roses and posies and quaint little children in old fashioned gardens. What magic in Kate Greenaway's name? Her lovely pictures of children, so dainty and full of grace, seem to breathe forth the very fragrance of prim little trim little gardens. A happy little mite was the tiny Kate Greenaway, a London child sent into the country to be nursed by an old family servant. Sometimes she ventured out with her nanan into the grain fields where the wheat towered high above her head. What enchanted vistas opened before her, stretching away for ever and ever, avenues of golden grain made brilliant with scarlet pimpernels, blue and white veronica, and gorgeous crimson poppies. But, oh, when she could visit her far-off flower-bank, it was more exciting still. There were queer old stiles to be climbed, and delightfully terrifying foot-planks to be crossed over such a deep, dark, mysterious stream. Then away through a shady wood to the mill. In the woods grew the large blue crane's bill, the purple vetch, and wild morning-glory, and up in the trees the wood-pigeons cooed. Around the mill wound a little river with forget-me-nots on its banks and apple-trees trailing their heavy branches almost into the stream. After a year or two in the country, Kate was sent back to London. Her father was a wood engraver, but he had not succeeded in business, so Mrs. Greenaway set up a shop to sell laces, children's dresses, and fancy goods. Kate was sent now to an infant school kept by a little old lady who wore a large frilly cap, a frilly muslin dress, a scarf over her shoulders, and a long apron. What a happy child she was, happier than either her brother or sisters, though they had the same surroundings. Her rich fancy found beauty everywhere. The Greenaway children were allowed to roam about freely in the neighborhood of their home. They had given their promise to go no farther than a certain exciting corner, and they always kept their word. But what streets those were through which they roamed! Where else were to be seen such grand, mysterious children guarded by their nurses, such rustling, perfumed ladies, and such fascinating shop windows? And on that street corner, what adventures! Now a sailor man with a wooden leg appealed to the sympathy of passers-by, displaying a large, lurid picture of a ship overturned by a whale. Now, hark, a drum and the sound of a weird little shriek, a punch and judy show off the small greenaway scamper to crowd around mr punch but alas when their interest in the performance was at a white heat just when the ghost was about to nab mr punch all too suddenly the manager would stop and declare that he would not proceed a bit further unless he was paid with some pennies now the little greenaways never had any pennies and as the other small onlookers were frequently in the same plight off would go mr punch to more profitable fields leaving black despair behind but then, no use for long grieving, Punch was soon replaced by those fascinating mechanical puppets, the Fantaccini, Mother Goose with her milk pails from which jumped little children, the skeleton that came to bits and joined itself together again, and four little figures dancing a quadrille. Rarely was the corner unoccupied. There was always the chance of tumblers, tight-rope dancers, and that delightful street organ, on top of which the ingeniously contrived figure of an executioner cut off the head of a queen about once every minute to the tune of the Marseillaise. While Kate lived in London, her bedroom window looked out over naught more beautiful than red roofs and chimney-pots, but she used to imagine that steps led up from those roofs to a lovely garden where nasturtiums and flowers were blooming so near to the sky. She used to fancy, too, that a secret door had opened for her in the queer old houses that joined their own, and that that door led through lines of interesting old rooms, all so curious and delightful, and ending at last in a garden. By and by she began to want to express all this in painting, her love of children and of gardens, and so she set to work and studied to be a painter. 
first she painted designs for valentines and christmas cards then she illustrated books and at last she wrote under the window her very own book of rhymes and drew its beautiful illustrations soon kate greenaway's fame spread around the world the quaint little frocks and aprons hats and breeches of her children so funnily prim and neat and yet so simple and graceful set the style in dress for two continents dear bright quiet little lady living in such seclusion she showed people more of the charm of children's ways than they had ever dreamed of their graces their thousand little prettinesses and she left a pure love of childhood in many a heart that had never felt it before marigold garden under the window mother goose griffiths william elliot american eighteen forty three through blank dr griffiths is a veteran of the civil war and a great traveller who has made ten trips to europe in eighteen seventy by invitation of the baron or damio of a province in japan he set out to organize schools there on american principles he crossed america just after the completion of the transcontinental railway when wild indians on ponies and soldiers at frontier forts still characterized the west after twenty-nine days on the pacific on a side-wheel steamer he spent seven weeks in yeddo and then went into the interior the first american ever to have lived in adamio's capital on his return to yeddo he crossed the country in midwinter often on snowshoes over the mountains where wolves and wild boar roamed after four years in japan he returned to this country and became a minister he has written japanese korean dutch belgian swiss and welsh fairy tales grimm wilhelm seventeen eighty six through eighteen fifty nine and jacob seventeen eighty five through eighteen sixty three the first and most important collectors of german folk tales hall sarah josepha american seventeen eighty eight through eighteen seventy nine Harris, Joel Chandler, American, 1848 through 1908. Little red-haired, freckled-faced midget of a boy dashing down the main street of a sleepy Georgia town behind a team of powerful horses and handling the reins with all the confidence of a six-foot hostler. Joel Chandler Harris, you mischievous little monkey, come down off that box at once. Your mother is horrified it was well for joel that he did not distress that good mother of his too often for all her hopes were centred on him long years ago the boy's father had deserted the two and his mother had shouldered with splendid courage the burden of their support she took in sewing and the two lived in a tiny cottage behind the great house of a friend eatonton was a typical little southern town of the days before the civil war it had a courthouse and a town square a tavern and several wide streets shadowed by rows of fine old trees on either side of the road behind the trim boxwood hedges rose stately colonial houses the white pillars of their piazzas glinting here and there through the screen of odorous cedars brightly blossoming myrtles and oleanders around them a fun-loving rough-and-tumble lad on the surface was joel playing all sorts of pranks with his friends and rolling in the white mud gullies or munching ginger cakes with the little negro children but he was a tender-hearted boy at bottom and never forgot a kindness see him now behind the old schoolhouse showing a wren's nest to three little girls with such delight in the tiny fragile thing and how gentle and tender and kind the little girls are to the lad a simple thing but he never forgot it never now at last came the time when joel must be up and doing one day he found these words in a newspaper boy wanted to learn the printer's trade here was his opportunity he was only fourteen years old but he put away his tops and marbles packed up his little belongings in an old-fashioned trunk kissed his mother good-bye and was off he went to work for mr joseph addison turner of turnwald a fine old plantation with cotton fields white as snow in the season and a group of negro cabins hid in a grove of oak trees behind the house mr turner published a paper called the countryman and the little printing office where the boy worked was a primitive place on the roof of which the squirrels scampered and the blue jays cracked their acorns 
not twenty steps from the office door a partridge had built her nest and was raising a brood of young while more than once a red fox went loping stealthily by to the woods it was hard to say whether joel enjoyed most the out-of-door life on the plantation tramping about with a boy just his age who knew every path in the countryside or browsing in mr turner's fine library for he dearly loved to read but when the work and play of the day were ended and the glow of the light wood knot could be seen in the negro cabins joel and the turner children would steal away from the house and visit their friends in the slave quarters tucked away in the nook of a chimney corner joel listened with eager interest while old harbert and uncle george terrell their black faces agleam in the firelight told their precious tales of Burr rabbit and all the other lore of beasts and birds handed down from their african forefathers and sometimes when the yellow yam baked in the ashes or a hoe cake browned on the shovel the negroes would croon a camp meeting hymn or sing a corn shucking melody so passed months and years at turnwald and then the war joel harris a youth with all the fire and passionate prejudices of boyhood sitting up on a fence and watching the victorious northern troops pass by ploughing ankle deep through the mud the defeat of the south meant the end of the countryman and the ruin of mr turner joel had to start life anew one paper after another gave him employment and then at last he began to contribute to the atlanta constitution all those lively negro folk tales impressed so vividly on his mind in the old days at turnwald the stories of uncle remus to joel's immense surprise uncle remus made him famous and so it happened that the little red-haired boy now grown a man with a wife and children of his own could offer his mother a real home and as his fame grew with the passing years he brought her increasing happiness and fulfilled all her early dreams uncle remus his songs and sayings daddy jake the runaway the tar baby harrison elizabeth american contemporary one of the founders of the national kindergarten college important works in storyland end of section fourteen